This is episode 60. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears, and I am your host on the Business of Architecture show, the show focused on helping you create a business that is fun, flexible, and profitable. Today's episode is sponsored by the Business of Architecture Conference, where you'll learn everything you ever wanted to know about creating an architecture business that is flexible, fun, and profitable. The conference will be held only online October 16th and 17th of 2014. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference to get on the list for early notification of discounted insider tickets. And I'm making those available to listeners of this show first. This past week, I launched a new website and podcast focused on marketing for architects, getting better clients, better projects, and better fees. You can find it by searching iTunes for The Architect Marketing Show. So please go over, subscribe to that show, let me know your thoughts, share that with your friends. Let's get the word out. My colleague Eric Bobro and I have a number of episodes lined up over there. In the latest, we talk with two architects that have implemented a marketing system that brings them a steady flow of clients. And they both had one thing in common. Effective marketing has allowed them to enjoy architecture, to work on great projects of their own choosing, and to work with great clients. So go to architectsmarketing.com to check out and hear that one. Just a little tidbit, Mona Quinn, one of the architects that we interviewed, talks about a simple strategy she used to get over 150 uh, great leads in uh, one weekend. So why are we doing this? Well, we believe architects are facing a silent war, and we want to give you the tools to fight it. We found that a lot of architects believe that it's possible to either make good money or have a passionate, fulfilling life, but not to do both. Architects have given up on creating good architecture and making good money. At least, that's what I found. Also, here's a couple questions for you. Why are you treated like a commodity at times as an architect? Why do you feel that you sometimes have to justify your fees? Why do clients take elements of your design out to reduce the price and reduce the quality of your design work? Why do you work so hard and get so little credit? Why do owners often trust contractors more than they trust you? The answer to these questions are all part of this silent war, and something here is wrong. To read the article on the silent war and join the forces against the axis of evil, search Google for Architect Marketing Silent War. There's an article, and this article touched a chord, and there's some great comments on there. Go over there and add yours. In today's episode, we talk with Rhode Island residential architect David Andreozzi. In addition to being an architect, David is currently serving as the chair of the Custom Residential Architects Network. In this episode, we discuss how he started his firm, where over half of his projects currently come from, hint, it rhymes with Minternet, specialization, advertising, and his number one marketing mistake. Here's the show. David, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, it's, it's good to have you. So, David, tell us a little bit about your practice. If you can take me back to the beginning, you know, if I were going out, or like, how did you start your practice? Well, it was, it's interesting. It basically, uh, it starts with um, uh, Mike Brady of the Brady Bunch. And so, I, hey, me and a lot of architects. I watched, I watched the uh, Brady Bunch, and I said, why? I mean, he gets to build models for a living, models of houses. And at the time, my father was a, a contractor. So I always said, you know what, I think I, and I was involved, starting to get involved with contracting. When I say involved with contracting, I was dragging crap to the dumpster and throw, filling up the dumpster. And I worked my way up through the uh, construction site and I learned how to use a hammer and then I learned how to do framing and then I learned how to uh, do uh, uh, plastering. And then eventually I ended up bidding projects. And this is during the summers, that's going through school learned how to bid projects and, and really involved to the point where when I was at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, I was actually taking furniture making. So my, I guess my, I, I, the passion for saying I love building, but I'd love to do it in sort of that three-dimensional architectural end, I got hooked on in, I would say, like seventh or eighth grade, very, very early, the mechanical drawing. And that has actually become sort of my, the ethos of what I think what makes our firm a little bit different is that um, when I think that when we show up at a job site, 
I mean, really and truly, I look at everybody as the same. We're all, I'm not some college educated, uh, uh, snobby artisan that knows better than you. I'm really and truly just one of the equal team play, equal players of the entire team. So you, you went to Rhode Island School of Design. You had this background in building. And then tell me about how you went from, you know, graduating from school, getting your architecture degree. Tell me about the process of actually, did you always want to be, have your own firm? So, so what happened, yes. So what happened was uh, my first, uh, my first, pro uh, my first job out of RISD was working for Rob Reno. And Rob Reno had just left Shope Reno Wharton. And it started a pro, uh, an office in or outside of Concord, New Hampshire. And so I was there for about six months or nine months, and things had slowed a little bit. And he was really – he was awesome. He was like, listen, things have slowed a little bit, and I don't mind keeping you on. But he said, you know, if you – but if I keep you on, I want you to stay. And he said, or I can recommend you go someplace else. And I said, well, can you recommend me to go to Chopin Award and his original firm? Well, that brought me to Stamp to uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. And the connection there obviously was, well, not obviously, is my heart and soul is Rhode Island. It's New England, the New England ethos, the shingle style. And so Chopin uh, Wharton was at the time one of the new upcoming architects and one of the top shingle style architects in the country. So I was right there at the hotbed immediately designing houses, uh, the biggest, most wonderful houses you can imagine. So th that really was the, the beginning. And then from that point on, I went through my process of educating and going through that. I almost looked at it as graduate school. And the interesting thing about that, I mean, what a hotbed of talent. I mean, at the right around me uh, in my drafting uh, room was what would be uh, Joe Moore, one of the most famous architects right now in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, uh, Mike Ember, one of the most celebrated architects in Texas and nationally. I mean, there's a, the amount of people that left that firm at that point when I was there, I could go on, is just amazing. So I really looked at it as being at one of the, the coolest uh, 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 graduate schools in the country. And, I mean, I'm in debt to both Bernard Wharton and Alan Shope uh, and Robert Reno before for setting me up with that education. From that point on, I just couldn't wait to the moment where I was going to stop my practice because I had a little bit of a little bit of supply because if my parents were in the business, the minute I was eligible to take the test, I was home back home in Rhode Island and with a first commission, and that was 26 years ago. So to help you jumpstart the practice, was it the fact that your family had projects that you could design? No, the, it actually was one, one single project that um, it was a, a family friend, and it came actually a little bit earlier than I was planning on starting the practice. And he basically said, I'm ready to design my first house. And so I came back just a little bit earlier than I planned. And that actually provided the impetus. And um, I was published locally pretty early. And from that point, it sort of caught and built over time. Okay, great. So you had that first commission. And then after that, how difficult was it to find? Do you remember those early days? Was there, how difficult was it to continue that up? You know, I, I don't, I, I don't remember. I do, I remember it's more, economic it's more cyclical with the economy and it didn't matter how how successful i've been through the years i mean the last the last three or four years have been sort of a, on a slow curve and that's starting to pick up again but if you look back i mean the highs and the lows have less to do with well I, i'm sure with some firms if you're nationally published and you start getting architectural digest this that and the other thing phones the phone starts ringing bigger and bigger in my case, where I'm mostly regional, I've done work outside of the region, but mostly regional, I mean, I find that I'm just very, very impacted by the economy as whether things are good and bad. And obviously, uh, things have not been great lately. Yeah. How do people generally find you, David? Now, are you finding? Well, it's, it, it's interesting. Some people are very, very surprised when I tell the story, and I've told it for years, is that while I'm slightly embarrassed about our third temporary website that we have up, because it's almost impossible to figure out, you have to, you have to figure out how to look at the images. It's that the three websites that we've created since the internet has started have actually generated, I would say between 65 and 70% of my major projects and commissions over the years, a huge amount. And so while I get local work of small, small, medium size, I can't tell you how many big, big projects have come 
by people actually doing a search on a local high-end architect, residential architect, shingle-style architect, Rhode Island, New England, using the keywords, narrowing it me down. I don't go to the top of the list or anything like that, but narrowing me down to the top 20, 20 or so. And then from that point, they, I think the work speaks for itself. They end up getting drawn into the site and finding out more about me, getting drawn over to my Facebook page and finding more about sort of my, my philosophy. And then the telephone call rings. And when the, and the phone rings, usually they're pretty hot and have already been bought into using me. And I say that's, it's pretty interesting because when we first set up the internet, I thought it was a joke. I'm not a joke, but I didn't think, I thought it was like the yellow pages. People were going to look at it and say, I've never, I've been in business again, 26 years. I've never gotten a single job from the yellow pages because there's an aspect of our job that's art and it's based on recommendations. And you would never buy a piece of art by looking at the yellow pages. And so it, it was surprising. It was dumbfounding to us that all of a sudden people were coming to us, but like really and wanting to use us. And our feeling was, was that this created this unusual, at least for the type of architecture that I do, is this unusual ability for a client sitting in their boxer shorts at home with their, them and their wife, or maybe they both have boxer shorts on, sitting there searching for architects going, hey, let's look at his work. And hey, I like that. And I like that. And they're not having the architects sitting there selling them like, oh, you have to use me. And that guy's an idiot. And this guy's incompetent. And, and this way, they're basically going through the website and buying into me without me being the salesperson. So it was this unusual paradox, I'll be honest with you. So that's an interesting, an interesting analogy, almost like having a, a virtual salesperson to kind of sell your practice without you having to overtly sell yourself. Well, your pictures, your pictures, they, they tell a lot about you. I mean, the fact is the other work that you show, and I, I, I can talk for hours about all the things that we've done wrong on the website, which basically is we put all of the work on my website now is the finest houses that I've done over the last 26 years, the biggest, finest houses. Well, the reality is that like 75% of my work is like $500,000 and less. And so what am I doing to nurture that? I've been basically shunning them away. And it's funny, we're going through this midlife crisis together. My associate, Dave Rizzolo, and my wife, Cheryl, who's been involved on an administrative partnership with us for the three of us for years. And we're looking at this saying, you know, this has been successful for 26 years, but what do we do different for the next 26 years? And I think that in part of our midlife crisis is we're saying we need to I think we're portraying only one message and it has to be a much broader message to inca encapsulate other types of work other than just these sort of high-end big projects that we've done in the past. David, how important do you think it is for architects to specialize on a particular form or type or whatever kind of specialty it is of architecture? Uh, that's a trick. That's a, a difficult question to answer because you can answer it once as saying, an architect, and you can answer it another way as saying architectural firm. So as an architectural firm with five practitioners can be extremely diverse. And one person can specialize in restaurants, the other person can specialize in modern contemporary modern homes, and the other person can specialize in traditional homes. And you're creating diversity. I don't believe I I think it's very rare that you would get somebody at the very, very, very top of their field that is going to specialize in very different types of archetypes and be really an A plus at all of the different archetypes. To think that I'm going to, I mean, the fact that I spent 26 years doing architecture and I would say 95% of my work is custom residential architecture, you would think that I have a higher aptitude to do a high quality architecture um, based on the products I know, the design I'm familiar with, the past designers I know the conferences I've taken specializing in that thing compared to if somebody walked in tomorrow and said, I would like you to do a train depot. And you'd say, okay, that would be, thank you very much. And you'd be excited about it, but you certainly couldn't say that you have equal qualifications. Even if you can, I'm sure that I've heard the argument, well, you know, you can just, an architect's responsibility is to go out there and learn what the, what the responsibilities and what the, the codes are and how it works. Yeah, I agree with that, but it doesn't mean, that you're going to design it as good as somebody that's been designing train depots for 26 years. So I, th I think that specializing, specializing has worked for me, but I should say that. Okay. 
And the people that end up using you, what, what is it that you think has been sort of your secret sauce about being able to get the clients that you've been able to, to land? Well, the, one of the things that, that we, uh, much of this was taught again through, from Chopra and Award and Rob Reno with the working drawings and Chopra and Award and with process is that for our working drawings for an average, um, let's say 6,000 square foot house are 90 to 110 pages. They're just like, they're the most massive set of drawings you've ever seen. Every detail, we're involved with everything, anything except for color and fabric and, and carpeting. Um, and what we do there is we've made a decision after being in practice for about 10 years that we won't take a job unless we are agree and approve the interior decorator and we agree and approve the uh, landscape architect. And the reason for that isn't so that we can control them. It's so that they can be an equal part of the process. They, they can be an equal team member and we're not fighting with each other. So, so when, when, and honestly, the way that we do it is that I try and show my plans to the decorator and landscape architect before I show it to the owner. And I expect them to do the same to me. So that we're basically designing it together as a team in the background. So the combination of this extensive set of working drawings, an unbelievably anal retentive um, documentation of meeting notes and following the process of, uh, of the contracts and following through the administration of the job in concert with organizing the teams and the teams working together. I think it creates something for the homeowner that's that I know is not the majority of architects that are working out there. And I know there is a minority that are doing it, and that's the way it should be done. David, you mentioned that as part of your stipulation, you require input to have input on the landscape design, the interior designer. When do you broach that subject? It's very early. It's, I would say that um, as early – as soon as the schematic design is done of a house, at that point – I will at that point bring landscape architect, uh, get the landscape architect hired, interviewed by the, approved by the client, hired, and we work together as I'm beginning the very st early stages of DD. They are beginning the schematic design on that. And, and we've spent a lot of time sitting down talking about my original part T. And that doesn't mean that they have to follow my, my literal sketch. And I will draw literal sketches of a driveway and a patio and, and I'll do that because that's how I think about spaces. I think about the spaces inside the house relating, and I think about the spaces inside the houses relating to the, the outside spaces. So I'm drawing them at the same time, but I'll give it to the landscape architect and say, okay, this is my party. This is what I kind of want. Now you work with it. And so things come back many times looking very different, but the, 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 the essence of the party stays the same. The lens, the decorating stays a little bit further. I get, I'd say I get about halfway through DD and starting working drawings, and then I'll bring the decorator in and we'll start to talk about furniture plans and lighting and all of the integral things that are involved, especially with the high end custom homes where you, they, people want them to be truly, uh, not anthropomorphic is the wrong word. I use that for architecture, but truly integrated from, from technology to design. So, um, it's important to have the decorator, like literally, almost like they're in your office. I mean, I tease sometimes about get, doing decorating in the office, and I don't think I ever will, because I, I just love working with all different great decorators and designers. Uh, have you ever had the, the, the um, situation where a client wants to do, wants to bring in a decorator that doesn't, isn't really a fit for the team? I've, yes, and um, I mean, I mean, I had a situation that imploded on me um, early on in, our, in, in, in my career. Um, I designed an early house that had become published, won uh, three awards locally. And um, I was asked to renovate that house when the person remarried about um, eight years later. And they did, the, the client did an amazing thing, actually. I mean, the client had met uh, uh, their new, their new wife, um, who had their own designer, who was a spatial designer. It was, she was, she wasn't an architect. She wasn't, she was a kitchen designer that was kind of doing architecture, but she had done a very big project for this person. And so basically the clients, like, I just adore them. 
Um, they did an amazing thing where they said, we're going to hire both of you. I mean, David's going to concentrate on the outside shell and the designer was going to actually sort of work on the inside. And I felt obligated because they really given me such a significant project starting out in business and I'm still in debt to them that I would do this. And it basically, the pro, it was, it was, I, the process imploded. It was impossible that it, it could have worked. It, it, it fell apart. And at that point, I, I mean, I lost somebody in my office who, who left the, the, just the tension that was in my office. She literally left with hives all over her. I mean, the amount of, it was just so, such a, um, just a very disturbing experience. And so I, I decided at that point that all of, all of the future projects have to be sort of the team. I have to be a team player with everybody and that has to be. And so it's difficult to say it, but in a way, I think it's comforting for the client to know, okay, okay, uh, I'll show you, you can meet my uh, decorator. I think you'll like her. And I, I meet many decorators and I add many uh, landscape architects, but you can tell when you get somebody that is going to be, fighting over whether who's going to buy, who's going to sell the sconce to the owner. I don't sell sconces to the owner. So why are you like, this is not something that I, we need to get beyond that. We need to create this big, large design team that where everybody is working for the owner. And so anyway, it it's, was one of the best decisions I ever made. David, you are a business owner. What currently, if there's anything that comes close, what currently keeps you up at night in terms of, you know, what weighs on your mind in terms of being a business owner? Um, it's funny because I, um, I think, and I, I mentioned earlier about this midlife crisis that we're going through, and I say that in the nicest sense. I mean, I think part of it is, 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 what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? Am I doing the right thing? I mean, where I'm spending my money on advertising, how I'm responding to clients, um, and lost opportunities of networking in the past. So those are, I think those are the things as you live and you learn. And that it goes back to being, getting involved nationally with the AIA, getting involved with CRAN, getting involved with going to symposiums, because you learn and you live and you get ideas of how to deal with all these things. But I think when I think of, and I get nervous, I get nervous about, okay, what can I change immediately? Or what can we change? And I have to, it's, it's scary to change, but to have the, have the guts to make change. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the ideas, one of the things that we're thinking, we're, going to do over the next year is set up uh, a, another office in Boston. And so it's it's only about an hour, 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 hour away, but a lot of my work's coming from Boston and it's going to make so much sense. And I've always, I've been afraid for 15 years to do it. I mean, you know, you have kids going, they first, they were going through private school and then they're going through college. And so now they're off doing their own thing. And so you're saying to yourself, there's no reason now to be scared. I mean, you're talking financially. You need to make, you need to be aggressive and be a big boy here, and you need to do it. And so those are the sorts of things. It's having the, the guts to uh, make those decisions. Yeah, you know, and what are, what are the primary fears? I mean, we all, we're all human, and we all have these fears, but when you're considering going into this new marketplace in, in Boston, I mean, what are the deep fears that you're having or just the insecurities, if you don't, don't mind sharing that with us? Well, um, you, it's obvious, what an interesting discussion for everybody to listen to. Um, it's, um, I know what I have and I know what I don't have. So what I have is, um, I'm getting, I'm already doing work outside in that area. And I, I believe that the type of work that I do, I would still, I'm in the, and I'm in a minority of designers architects that do that type of work. So that is what I'm, I know is, is fine. And I know that I have relationships with landscape architects and designers, and I know people around the Boston area. So that's fine. What I don't have is relationships, because those people, we have two-way relationships, right? Because I recommend the landscape architect and they recommend me. So there's a dynamic back and forth. And the same with the interior designer. I meet a new designer and I like their work and they like my work. And we begin this sort of these new synergies what I don't have is any dynamic with real estate agents because real estate agents, they don't owe anything. You, they don't, I can't give a real estate agent anything yet. All they can do is give something to me. And I do believe that to create a long term, 
if I was moving my entire office there, which I'm not, which would be much more risky. I'm talking about starting out and having a satellite so it's closer to my clients in that area. I think that would be more risky because I don't know how you would make those connections because they already know 10 architects and they're, they recommend three. So you're going to knock on your door and do your sales routine and then they're going to recommend you. It's not going to work that way. So that is a true dynamic that I don't know how an architect or even a contractor breaks through that because the contractor is in the same situation as well. David, you mentioned that you're doing advertising right now. Well, we've, we've gone on and off and advertised in the past. And we, have, we put our advertising money in different ways. So where we did, we might do it locally. We might do money on photography. We might, so we're pushing money in different ways. I mean, wouldn't it be nice? I wish I had, I wish I had the other 75% of the projects that I didn't photograph over the years. I mean, you know, again, you have to just choose and it's becoming a little bit easier now to get, to go out and take like general shots, but, Listen, nothing's going to beat a professional photographer's shots, period, the end. Uh, but in this case, so we choose, we'll choose vehicles, either magazines or, or, or guides that we think are aggressive or, or things that we want to experiment with for a year or two, and we see how it goes. So when you say guides or magazines, are you talking about paid ads in those particular publications? Yeah, but my most recent uh, uh, commitment is to it's called Boston Design Guide, and so basically there's an they have an online presence, but they really have this hard copy book that has the top architects in all of Boston, and it's distributed throughout the you know the Boston area. So again, that's part of my process of sort of re reintroducing myself to the Boston area. I mean, I have the Boston projects, so you focus on those projects and you begin to nurture that 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 business. And in terms of advertising dollars, what lessons have you learned about that kind of uh, overt marketing in terms of lessons learned, in terms of mistakes maybe, or things that you find that work? What's your, what's your perspective on spending I, money like I, that? I, I, I'm pretty convinced that I've not received a job from advertising and because I think it's about building your brand. And I just don't believe that in all the years – and it, because if you think about it, if I, when I think about it, I've advertised in spurts in various different places. And di but what I've also done, I've, I've been published locally for 26 years, and I don't get jobs from that. So if I'm being published in the magazine, that's that's 10 times better than placing an ad as far as provenance. If I'm not getting a, a telephone call from that. So and the problem with architecture, or at least the type of architecture that I do, which is custom residential architecture, is, you know, people aren't, they don't look at an ad and say, hey, I want to buy a Prius. Honey, let's get a Prius. So you, that doesn't work that way. They, when they decide they're going to buy a piece of property, their dynamics are, okay, now I'm looking for an architect. And they may have seen my ad three years ago. And unless they ripped it out and stuck it in a folder, which actually happens sometimes, it's it, all you can do is hope that maybe you're building branding. But um, I, I know it's, it sounds crazy, but um, it's it's word of mouth and it's it's other it's a combination of things, but nothing direct. Okay, no, absolutely. And you you, you mentioned when you're thinking about the past, David, and going through this midlife change right now and reevaluation. You you talked about some missed opportunities in networking. Can you give us some advice for architects who want to be able to network correctly? Give us some insights about what you've learned about networking. Well, I have to give a shout out to Mark Hutker, who's an amazing architect um, in, in the in the in, in the Cape Cod area, in the Islands area here in Massachusetts, and he's actually spoken at Cran symposiums on his ability to market in the best sense. And in marketing, is more than just saying I'm going to go out and uh, you know send ads and and, and send uh, bubblegum cards with my architecture on it, so that people have it. It's really about understanding that from the time the telephone call comes in to the people that you're meeting and the people you're recording their names and you're sending thank you, handwritten thank you notes and, and you're staying in contact with real estate agents that you've had brushes with. If I think of how many people that I've had brushes with in, in my first 10 or 15 years that, well, you know, I was getting my big, a big commission and I'm sitting there and there's a real estate agent that sold it. There's a real estate agent that bought it. And I'm sitting with my client 
and I don't remember those other two people's names. Well, why? that was an opportunity to take their business cards and start to send them mailers because they know me. So it's not coming off as unnatural. So I think that that's the part of the part of business that I could learn more about. And I'm starting to think more about is it's not selling yourself. It's just nurturing your existing relationships. I mean, one is um, staying in contact with my existing clients. I mean, duh. I mean, we started that about uh, four years ago. And for, for four or five years ago, we started our Facebook page. I was like a little bit like, I, I don't want to be bothering my clients. But, you know, I set up the Facebook page and immediately my clients started joining and I started posting pictures of construction uh, of their of, of, of construction projects ongoing and clients are going, oh, my God, I love the project. Thank you so much. And other clients like thanking me for their project they did in the past. And there's this like dynamic, this natural fraternity that's occurring on Facebook and you're building brand. And I, I didn't do that for fifth, the first 15 years of my of, of my career. So that's sort of the lessons that I'm sort of thinking about for the next uh, for the next half of my career. And I say in a positive way. It's not in a negative, sleazy, sleazy way. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, any any looking back in retrospect, that's a great insight, David, about something that you've learned about business that you want to improve upon and do better in the future. Is there anything else like that in the past that you think that maybe some missed opportunities that you're going to try to change? No, I mean um, – We've, we've made so many, I mean, going back, the changes, each change that we've made over the years have, from learning, there are a lot of learning things. I mean, one is just sort of the way that I treat employees. I mean, I originally viewed employees as, I'm talking about the first 10 years, I viewed an employee as a temporary person like myself that was coming to basically uh, learn the trade and go to graduate school as, a, as, as I view it. And then they're going to go off and start their own practice. And more recently, I, I mean, I'm saying not more recently, but after about 10 years of my practice, I realized that was definitely not the way to view employees. I viewed them as family. I mean, I view from the time I'm hiring a, hiring an employee, I'm thinking to myself, is this somebody that could be part of our family for forever? And I know that's an unfair question, but that is really how I view it. And that has, has changed how my aspect of how I pay and how our benefit packages work and, and everything all the way down the line. I view us, and again, it goes back to team, 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 team. Team as construction, in the construction process, also with the contractor, landscape architect, designer, owner, and builder, but then, then team in the office. Uh, somebody early on, one of the employees, as I came up, ranting like what's going on and we got to get through this process and they said if you were just upbeat and positive like it, it would be so much easier to solve this problem there, there's so much tension and you so you learn these lessons and you know okay i'm going to temper myself and we're going to do this soft and warm and fuzzy and those are the lessons you learn <laughs> david it's been a great conversation today and thank you for uh, taking this leadership role and uh, custom residential architects. And I know that, you know, it's uh, something that not many people would do because I know it does take a lot of effort, and I know you spend a lot of time as the CRAN chair. But just give us, a, give us a plug really quickly for the symposium. Tell us once again why architects should go to the, the CRAN symposium and what they're going to discover there. So the CRAN, the, the symposium, which is done annually, and we're expecting about 225 people this year, um, is a two and a, it's two and a half, two and a half, three days. It's going to include walking tour, a walking tour of Charleston, which is, oh, my God, the most beautiful place to go in the world. Um, it's going to include a, a, a riding tour out to the islands to see the most beautiful architect design work, I mean, in that area. Then it's going to include, I think, two days worth of conferences of some of the leading architects from all over the country, again, including Andres Duani and Robert A. M. Stern, just to mention two, but I mean, the line, it goes on from there. Um, and then the most important thing, I mean, the thing that I enjoy most about it, and the most important thing for you is the ability to actually meet people and talk to your own brethren, your own fellow custom residential architects that do exactly what you do, but they do it a little differently than you do. And you meet them during the day in between courses, 
and you meet them when you go out to dinner because we have planned dinners at night and you meet them at different tables of 10 and you talk to them and the dynamics, the education that you get. I have to tell you that, you know, when I first, uh, I said earlier that I really wasn't a big fan of the AIA when I started this process. And um, my wife, Cheryl, she was involved uh, on another managing managing um, dental firms early on, and she was always going to conferences. And she was the one that said, David, you need to go to the National AIA Conference. And I'm like, honey, like, it's there's nothing residential there. I, I'm not. She said, you need to go, you need to go, you need to go. I said, okay, so I went. So I did go, and as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I, there was very little information on residential architecture, no residential support. But what I would do is I would take nine bad courses but take two good ones, and I'd make three or four relationships that I'd say, you know what, this was really worth it. And it would give me this vibrancy, this, this excitement this, to, to push me through and say, wow, I'm, I'm elevated. Well, this is that on steroids because you're basically sitting in a group of 200 residential architects that are doing exactly what you do and you're not in competition with and you can sit down and tell stories from paying bills to getting paid to dealing with difficult clients. I mean, some of the fun stories you hear, I mean, it's an amazing experience. So I would encourage if anybody is looking for anything that, to look for credits, to look for your, your learning credits, please consider going. And again, that's on our AIA website, AIA.org backslash CRAN. There's, there's a link there, but that link will be active for sign up in about a year. I mean, in a month. And that will be September 18th to the 20th in Charleston, South Carolina. Excellent. David Andreozzi is a custom residential architect based out of Rhode Island. He's also the national chair of the Custom Residential Architects Network, which is a knowledge community of the AIA. And through his instrumentality, the CRAN Network has produced a series of videos to help educate prospective clients about what architects do so that when they get to the point of wanting to hire you, they have a better understanding of the value you provide and hopefully they'll be turned into a raving fan instead of a skeptic. Can I, can I jump in and say one more thing before we go? Please. It's, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if people are interested in CRAN itself, getting involved either on a national level, on a, on a subcommittee, we have many subcommittees. We have the actual AG, which is the advisory group itself, which you're, you're pulled onto, but we have many subcommittees. If you want to get involved, go to that site. First of all, join the site so you get your emailings. But then reach out to us and just show us your interest because we're looking. And the other thing that we're looking for very badly is we're looking for emerging professionals. So we already we started an emerging professionals group, and I believe we already have six or seven people there. We want to fill that out to 15. There's also a link on the site there where you can sign up if you're an emerging professional and you're doing custom residential architecture. I'm sorry I had to throw that plug in for all of Cram. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. And I would also be interested in getting some feedback, David. Let's let's try to encourage some feedback from the people listening today. I want to hear from the, the our listeners in the UK and in Australia. I want to hear about your professional organizations. I want to hear, you know, is it the same for architects that are members of REBA or the Australian Institute of Architects? What kind of support do you get as a residential architect? It'd be interesting, David, as we focused on this mostly the U.S.-based, you know, um, CRAN, to hear some different experiences from architects in these other nations. And maybe there's something that they can learn from what CRAN is doing. And likewise, maybe there's some things that they're doing that we can learn from. That's a great idea. Excellent. So please leave your feedback on the show page. Visit businessofarchitecture.com. And, David, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you again. Okay. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment. 
except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.